Hello everybody, I'm Michael Brown from Montgomery College Television and I'll be your moderator for today's town hall. We're on the Germantown campus in room 151 of the Bioscience Education Center and Dr. Pollard is looking forward to hearing from you today. As always, if you're nearby, why don't you come on by? We'd love to have you in the room with us. We encourage you to ask questions, state opinions, and pick different topics of discussion. Now, if you are watching online or you're watching on MCTV, you can email your question to townhall at montgomerycollege.edu. If you're watching on Facebook Live, we look forward to your comments and questions. You can also send your questions in via Twitter, at Montgomery Call, hashtag Ask Dr. Pollard. And you can do us all a favor by keeping your questions brief. One final note, if whether you're here in the room or you're watching online, please make sure you identify yourself before you ask your question. And now it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Darian Pollard. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to welcome you to the first uh, town hall meeting for this academic year. I'm delighted to see a full room. I just want to give a special shout out to students. Uh, we have a, a class of students and we have some here. And I'm just really excited that we have uh, the folks who the reason why we do the work in the room. So thank you all for choosing to be here. And thank you to an outstanding faculty member who made it a part of an assignment. Uh, that being said, let's talk a little bit about a few things. I have a brief intro that I want to get through and then we'll open it up to questions. Uh, I am tightly scripted so that I will stay on time. I think I have five minutes that Dr. Gibbons gave me to do this. So I'm going to read this if I can and we're going to make it through. Uh, I want to first off say thank you to each of you who extended some congratulations to me regarding the Carnegie Award. That to me uh, meant more than anything to actually have members of the college community uh, offer some words of encouragement and feedback. I was deeply honored and sincerely grateful for that. But probably for me, and many of you who wrote me and I wrote you back, I said this, it wasn't because this was about me. I think this is about the work of the college. It's about the things that we've been doing in spaces and classrooms and meeting rooms and all the things you do in lifting up the work of Montgomery College. Every person who is here contributes significantly to the success of our students, to the mission of the college, and most importantly, to ensuring that we are actualizing the work that we say that we're supposed to be doing. Uh, I'm deeply grateful to work at a college that cares about students, that accepts bold missions and believes that vision is important and works hard to do, be able to do that. Uh, we've had some remarkable outcomes. I think that's what has caught the attention of folks like the Carnegie Corporation. So I want to say thank you and share this award with you because I think it's symbolic of who we are as an organization. Now, in case you didn't notice, we were uh, the only community college recognized in this particular set. And as a matter of fact, in over the years that this has been awarded, only two uh, community colleges have been recognized. So I think that says a lot about who we are and the work that we do. And I also think it says something about the values that we espouse as an organization. And the work that all of you have been doing very thoughtfully around DACA and lifting up the work of our students who are experiencing this, who are trying to figure out how to navigate very challenging times, uh, that to me says a lot about who we are and the values of our organization. Now I don't know if you all have been following the news as close as I do, I've become a little addicted. Uh, to news cycles. But what's really important about that is that in this news cycle, I've been able to hear and see a lot of the stories of our students being lifted up and put into the broad stream media. Locally and nationally, Montgomery College students who share their stories have been picked up in places like the Washington Post, various news uh, agencies online, and also here our own Bethesda Beat, which did a wonderful story about our students. Um, I also have received lots of calls and emails and letters from our faculty and staff uh, about how to handle and how to respond to the needs of our DACA students in the classroom, where to send them for resources, and also more importantly, how to respond to their questions. So our legal office has been very uh, thoughtful in helping to provide guidance. And I really want to shout out to Student Affairs who put together a thoughtful letter to all students, 158,000 folks got the letter, but also put together a website that had an abundance of resources for students who are wanting to know what resources the college has, but also connecting them to community resources. I also want to thank our foundation who's been very thoughtful in trying to figure out how they can use private philanthropy to assist in this space as well. 
uh, the compassion that our faculty and staff have shown uh, during this time, I think is truly remarkable, and I'm grateful to work at a college that lives its values out loud. Um, we have also been taking some very practical steps in this. Just on Monday night, I do know at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Campus, there was a forum that was held and some legal information was provided and discussed some challenges right now that exist uh, for students who are in DACA status. Uh, my office will be hosting a panel discussion on October 5th. We're bringing in some folks to help us talk about uh, experts about law, uh, legal issues, uh, migration policy, philosophy, and history, and look at the intersections of that, and several of our own faculty members are going to be on that panel. We're also going to have uh, streamers as well who will be in the room to share and be a part of that panel as well. We're trying to make the conversation a higher level one about policy and what are the next steps as we move beyond trying to figure out where we are in this moment, but how to really address long term some of the issues and to place it, I hope, within a context that we all might be able to understand. Um, there's a lot of compassion that we're seeing from folks regarding our DACA students, and I think um, this is really what it means to make access transformational that we're being very intentional about that work here at the college. And I think it also helps to level the playing field wherever possible. Um, it prepares our students for the work uh, and the world that they live in, and they get to be a part of a broader discourse community that's very important around that. And that's one of the things I think is particularly important for the college, the issue of opportunity. How do we make sure that we're meeting people where they are, providing them access to higher education, and helping them to take advantage of the resources of our institution? Um, as you may have heard, in April, a group of our students uh, uh, created an environmental game uh, in our environmental game design class, and they won first place among all college students nationally in the Arctic Climate Game Contest. Uh, they were recognized just uh, on Tuesday by the County Council, and this is a competition that grew out of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's efforts to increase climate change education and to do it in fun ways. So they designed a game, and then this game is they're also trying to figure out how to put it now commercially in middle school classrooms. So this is really, really exciting for them. Uh, they were honored, as I said, just yesterday with, at the County Council and presented a proclamation by Councilmember Craig Rice. Uh, their game was designed for middle school students, and they're trying to figure out now how to scale that. Uh, it was really exciting for them, and, they, this, and their faculty member, oh my God, was so proud. And when they got to speak to the council, the first person that they talked to was their faculty member. And that, to me, I think says a lot about what happens in these spaces. Also this summer, 13 of our students from the college participated in internships at federal agencies, uh, which gave them some very terrific experiences in STEM areas. Uh, these were highly competitive positions and placements in which our students rank nationally against others from four, two and four year colleges across the institution, uh, the country. And I know that these numbers are hard to believe, but Montgomery College students made up a full one-third of the community college winners' slots in the National Institutes of Health. Our faculty and staff helped 56 students develop materials to submit, and eight of them were selected to participate in this very prestigious uh, recognition and intern experience. And as you can see uh, from the poster sessions here, they contributed some very advanced science. Uh, so they were actually a part of a research team and embedded in that. It was not just simply come in and take notes. They were actually engaged in that. Uh, they were paired with an NIH researcher and focused on a particular summer research project that they were an active member of the team. Their topic stretched from anatomy of primate memory to gene function in human cancers. So I'm very excited for these students, and I think this is just one example of the opportunities that Montgomery College tries to present for its students. And of course, we had wonderful opportunities in the humanities that gave our students beyond uh, the experience in the classroom as well. We had students placed in a number of museums this summer doing work in many different spaces. So this idea of how we put together what happens in the classroom with what happens in the real world, I think is most relevant for our students. So, to me, it's a pleasant reminder of why we do the work, but more importantly, I think a good way for me to be quiet now and open up uh, questions from the floor. 
All right, our first question is, an on, actually it's two online questions that kind of dovetail uh, one to the other. Uh, the first is from Chris Emad. I'm a student at MC. My question is, why can't we have cybersecurity classes on the Rockville campus? Mm -hmm. uh, the Rockville campus has a dedicated computer sciences building. Why can't some be taught there? And then this dovetails into a question from James M who wants to know, is there any possibility of extending our nursing program to Germantown? Students struggle to make it up to make it to Tacoma Park Silver Spring. And I'm sure this is a rhetorical question at the end. Have you seen I-270 in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> so many of the employees in the, in the room know that I actually live in Clarksburg at the top of Montgomery County. So 270 is my life. Um, and it is not pleasant after Labor Day. Uh, this morning I had a whole series of conversations using words that I will not use in public about uh, the traffic that was taking place on 270 today. So I want to thank Chris and James for their question. I think they dovetail really well, and I have some uh, notes that I want to share. Uh, just one correction, we don't have a computer science build, a building dedicated just for computer science on the Rockville campus. Uh, we do have a building that hosts computer science, but also a number of other programs in it. So I think that's just a, a good thing to know. Very similar, a lot of buildings may have one name on it, but it may have multiple programs in there. But what's really important about the question that I think that both of uh, those students ask is about resources. Um, there are certain programs at the college that are very expensive to run. Uh, they have highly specialized equipment. Uh, they have uh, very uh, highly specialized spaces that are needed to deliver that instruction. Um, our computer uh, cybersecurity is one such program. Nursing is another such program. Biotechnology, uh, which is delivered actually in this building, one of our most expensive programs. We have these programs because we know we're meeting a need in our community, but what's very important about that, we can't replicate it on every campus because of that. In fact, a lot of this equipment that we have in those programs are sought by grant dollars that we actually have to deliver them in a particular space, maintain them, and hopefully over time grow a program if we can, if the market would bear that. Um, I do know that there's great interest because 270 is real. Uh, we have three campuses and two educational sites and multiple uh, things that we do across the, uh, the county. So I do know that that's a unique challenge that we want to be responsive to. But we also think about how we may be able to deliver courses, maybe not entire programs. So since Chris had asked the question early, early oh boy, had asked the question earlier, I got, had a little research so I could find out here. Um, we are right now in cybersecurity. We have plans in a new building uh, to be, have a space dedicated for cybersecurity labs there. Um, and we're also in a pilot program. We're currently running two cybersecurity courses that are being taught uh, this fall, one at Rockville and then one also at Tacoma Park. And this spring, we'll also be offering some at two at Rockville and three in Tacoma Park. This will not be the entire program of study, but there will be courses. And hopefully, uh, students might take advantage of our shuttle, which will take you between campuses as a way to help you connect. Um, I would love to see us replicate all programs on all campuses. Uh, that's not financially sustainable. And given uh, also the market, we don't, we don't want to overproduce a number of graduates that would not be able to find work. So we have to be very intentional about that as well. So I hope that responds uh, to their questions. All right, we have another online question that came in uh, via email. This is from Lori Kelman, mm. uh, biotechnology professor. Oh. Since I've been at MC, full-time faculty salary has been determined by collective bargaining. This year's budget included a request for sufficient funds for the negotiated salary for full-time faculty, and enough money was approved, approved to cover the salary. Why hasn't management honored the contract? Hmm. Thank you, uh, Lori. Uh, Lori, I really appreciate the fact that she asked the question. I think if you all may, and I can extend my congratulations again. Lori uh, was our, Lori Cameron was our full-time faculty 
Member of the Year is recognized by her peers, and we're very grateful that we have someone who does phenomenal work in our biotechnology program, which I was just mentioning a moment ago, and then also someone who believes deeply in students. So thank you, uh, Lori, for that question. I think kind of related to the last question I said, uh, there's a lot of factors that impact the work that we do here. Uh, our investments in our operating budget as it relates to our biotechnology program, for instance, has been significant. We do a lot of lobbying uh, for the facilities as well as for salaries for all employees. Uh, we spend a considerable amount of time. That's a huge portion of the work that I do as a college president, Laurie, and I think you know that. But I also would offer that there's a very complex set of situations that play in here. Uh, faculty salary raises are still on the table. Uh, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to move in a good space in that very soon. But because we are still negotiating, uh, one of the things that I know is that legally there are certain things I can and cannot say about this, so I'm going to actually turn it over to somebody who manages that for us. Uh, Ms. Heather, if you don't mind uh, talking a little bit more about this, I don't know where the microphone went. Here's Ms. Heather over here, if you don't mind. And Heather might be able to uh, add a little bit more to supplement what I said. We're coming. He's coming. He's coming. <laughs> we have a question from the audience. Go respond. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just to add a little uh, bit more information to what Dr. Pollard was saying, uh, that is correct that we do uh, have a collective bargaining agreement with our faculty uh, and that our salaries are determined for our faculty through the collective bargaining agreement. But there's also a provision in the agreement that tells us what we need to do if there's some kind of shortfall in funding. And when we went to the county this year to ask for our funding for 2017-2018, there was a significant gap uh, in what we asked for versus what we were given. Now the county uh, did the best uh, that it possibly could uh, in these circumstances, and so there is a mechanism within the collective bargaining agreement to address the shortfall. So what's happening right now is the parties are using that mechanism that we have built into the collective bargaining agreement to try to come to resolution. And while we are in this process of negotiation, we are limited in what we can discuss, uh, but it is our hope uh, that we will come to resolution and we will continue to keep the college community as informed as we can as we work our way through that mechanism. Thank you. I want to really thank Heather because those of you who uh, know me a little well, I, I tend to be very direct and what I say, I said, well, just, just say this. She said, you can't say that. Uh, <laughs> that we, we are in the process of negotiation. I said, but what about, she said, no, you, you, le you legally cannot say certain types of things. I said, okay. Um, so thank you, Lori, for the question. I hope that it's responsive. And I'm also hopeful that we'll have the opportunity to see this in. And I also want to echo something that Lori said. Our county uh, has done phenomenal work in helping to support this organization. Uh, over 50% of the county's budget uh, excuse me, the college's budget comes from the county. And as a result of that, when the county experiences challenges and they contract, we contract as well. When we have enrollment cycles such as we're having right now, when we are down in enrollment, uh, that is a decrease in revenue that is coming to the organization. So one of the critiques that was actually offered to me earlier in a meeting we were in is, Darian, we need to talk more about this collective ownership that we need to have about this conversation. It's not just Darian who goes to uh, the county and to the state to ask for money. Many people play a part of that, and we have to be very thoughtful about telling our story, but also understanding the consequences of certain types of things that are happening. So the economy is real. We all live it. Just like 270 in the traffic, the economy is real. So we have to be very thoughtful and intentional about how we allocate resources. And also know that con there are consequences of things that we do, particularly around enrollment. So I really want to thank Lori for the question. Thank you, Heather, for the help. And I will stop before you start throwing things at me. All right, we, uh, we are lucky enough today to have an entire class of first year students from uh, Germantown with us today. And they have a whole bunch of questions about textbooks. Oh boy. Yep. Uh, so I'll just kind of run through them real quickly. Okay. The cost of textbooks, honestly, can't they be cheaper or free? Smiley face. Uh, the cost of textbooks. <laughs> Can we lower textbook prices and get an arcade? <laughs> I read what's on the paper, for the most part. 
and then book cost. But, so I, I tell you, um, I'm going to have you, Mike, go stand next to Dr. Mills. I know he's in here. Uh, you just walk right past him, but we'll come back in a moment. What I think is really important about this, and thank you all, this particular class, if I understand, is writing, this is their argument persuasive paper on a policy issue. So, um, and they are going to identify a policy that they want to write about. I think you'll have a number of policy papers on textbooks, from what I understand. So textbook costs are set by the publishers, um, and they choose uh, based on what they guarantee the authors to make, all the middlemen and what they need to make, how much they're going to charge for the intellectual property that's contained within that particular textbook. Um, but we know nationally and locally that textbook costs are significant. Uh, I remember when I was a student, uh, it was expensive, you just, you, you dread it, and unfortunately what ends up happening is a lot of students simply do not acquire the textbook. And when we know that, what does that mean? They're going to automatically start behind, and unfortunately it's also going to mean that they're not going to be able to catch up because they don't have access to the textbook. Oftentimes if we have some available, there are loans and libraries and all of those types of things, but at the end of the day, you and I both know that that's not going to be sufficient for a lot of students. So what we have had here, uh, in what you've seen hopefully, is the rise of something called open educational resources, where faculty are working, uh, looking at online materials to put together uh, resources that can be used as instructional materials. Uh, these are typically no cost or low cost to students. Uh, they typically are very current and relevant because they're very uh, contemporary in what they do. And the other thing that they do is it really engages faculty, I believe, in the ownership of, the, of what happens in their classroom in terms of instructional materials. Um, I used to call it the tyranny of the textbook because you would get here, you have to figure out, oh, well, this book doesn't want to do what I want. And you, have, and you keep jumping around to find which textbook is going to do what you want to do. So the burden that you feel as students and paying for it is also sometimes, sometimes the burden that faculty feel in trying to find the right textbook for the content that they're trying to deliver in their classroom. So through open educational resources, we have uh, been able to move to a growing number of sections at Montgomery College that are delivered strictly through open educational resources. Our Z degree, and they're also marked appropriately within the class schedule so that you can see them and maybe opt for those classes if that's something that is important to you. And Dr. Mike Mills, working with several faculty members, is leading this initiative. And maybe you could talk a little bit about it more so than what I did. Sure. As Dr. Pollard said, we are increasing the number of courses each semester that are zero uh, textbook. Uh, this semester, we have more than 300 sections uh, offered throughout the college. In the spring, we had just over 200 sections. So more and more faculty are getting on board. We've estimated that in the past year, we've saved students about a million dollars in textbook costs. Uh, and it's not just about textbook costs, it's about success as well. We want you to be successful in those courses even if you're not using a textbook. And the data we have show that your students who are in Z courses are as successful, if not more so, than the average uh, courses with a textbook. So we continue to, to increase the, the number of sections. We have more and more faculty who are looking forward to this mode of delivery. And as Dr. Pollard said, we have several degrees that will be coming on board. Our general studies degree uh, will be fully in a Z degree option within the next uh, two semesters. And then we're also looking at business and communications. Thank you very much, Dr. Mills. Uh, Stand up. How do I introduce myself? You just just introduce yourself. Oh, and, uh, I'm, my name is Ben. I'm here at MC. My first year. Hi, Ben. Um, my question is, why don't we have like any singing programs, like as in Tacoma Park? Singing? Yeah, like musical singing and oh, stuff like that. Oh, you know what? I uh, I don't know. I didn't know that we did not. But what I'm very happy to do is go back and find out. Typically, uh, these are based again on space because typically music courses require a specialized space. I think we do offer, I, don't do, I know we do offer dance at Tacoma Park, uh, but we may not have offered music. I know we do theater there, so I'm very happy to go back and ask that question. And we look at how we disperse those among the campuses. That's a great question. I'm a singer, so I appreciate what you're saying. And I'm liking them shoes, dude. <laughs> they are giving me life. I like it. I mean the shoes, because mine are very uncomfortable right now, so I just keep. <laughs> and Chris's socks, right? I'm loving them. Not yet. They're warming up still. All right. Okay, we thought we had a question in here. We don't, so we have a very intriguing online question from oh boy. Andy. Intriguing. 
Andy is a student. I have a couple of friends who have DACA, and I know they are nervous about their circumstances. Hmm. The college has been very supportive of our students, but what would we do if an ICE agent came into a classroom? And part two, could I get in trouble if I protect my friends from an ICE agent? Hmm. So thank you, uh, Danny, for being concerned about your, your friends. Um, I think um, they would be very heartened to know that uh, one of their colleagues uh, is con concerned about them. So thank you for that question. So if an ICE agent were to show up in one of our classrooms, first of all, we think that's highly unlikely. Uh, ICE has articulated a belief or a, a priority list, and in that priority list, educational institutions are seen as very low in that. However, we also know are very high, so they would not come to a, a typically to an educational facility and some other ones that fall into that category. That being said, we also know that we can't control everything that happens and oftentimes there are mitigating factors as to what occurs there. So if an ICE agent were to show up in our classrooms, uh, what immediately happens is a faculty member should ask for appropriate ID of that person, gather their name, their badge number, what agency they're from, and then we also then contact our uh, safety office and our general counsel because in order to actually serve or a warrant or to request someone to come out there's a process that they have to serve the institution with uh, we have not experienced that at the college uh, we're very hopeful that we will not uh, but we have our uh, safety and security officers who are being trained on this issue uh, through uh, Chief Harrison. We have our general counsel who's very well abreast of these issues and spends a lot of time with them. So I'm very hopeful uh, that that will not happen. So that was the first part of the question. What was the second part? I don't remember. Oh, um, can oh, will you get in trouble? Yeah, I, I, I don't provide legal advice in these environments, but what I say is that I think when you're doing the right thing and following the law, I think you'll be fine. Okay. I hope you'll be fine. Any follow-up in the room? All right, I'm gonna to go to another uh, online question. This is from BG, she is a staff, he or she is a st staff person. I work at the college and just got my degree, but I haven't been able to get a promotion. I understand that those at the top of the grade can't get the degree attainment boost, which is, which is a salary enhancement. I am also told that I don't have the right experience. How can I get more experience? How about trainee positions? Mm. Well, thank you, BG, uh, for that, that question. I think there's a lot of things that were embedded in the conversation that she posed there. Uh, first of all, what I think is really, or he or she for that matter, what I think is really important, let me first salute you for going back and continuing your education. I think one of the wonderful benefits that Montgomery College provides for its employees are opportunities for them to go and uh, secure advanced degrees. So congratulations for you for that. And I can understand your frustration. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the more you want to move up in an organization, there are fewer of those positions that exist. Uh, fortunately, there's only one president. <laughs> Sometimes, unfortunately, as well. Uh, and the same thing occurs in multiple levels of the organization. And sometimes that means that if you want to have that aspiration, sometimes you do have to look in other places. And, I, and I'm not saying anybody has to leave, but if your intent is for upward mobility and it's not aligned with succession that's happening within your organization, um, we, I want to make sure you're well prepared, you have the experiences you can, and move into those other positions as necessary. Now that being said, we also hope that there are career opportunities within the organization. And I think what I also heard you say is how do you acquire or gain some of that experience that allow you to be uh, qualified for positions when we post them that may say X number of years of experience. So one of the things I'm actually going to do is to talk with Krista and Mr. Roop and HR because I'm very interested in how we choose to write job descriptions, right? I think oftentimes when someone leaves the organization, those of us who are in hiring positions, sometimes our tendency is to think about replacing them with the person who left. You know, so that per and when we say that, oh, this person had X number of years of experience, this person could do this, this, and this, without sometimes remembering that X person did not come into that position being able to do those things. They acquired them over time, they had experience, exposure, investment in professional uh, development. So I think we want to sit down and have a sub, like we've started, which is why this conversation about how we think about 
responsibilities and those things because we can't expect somebody to come in. Uh, Darian leaves her position and she's been in this job for 40 years and we, we go hire Janelle who's new and to do it and Janelle supposed to be able to do everything that you know Darian did for 40 after 40 years of experience that's probably not going to happen. So I think we have to talk about our expectations as an organization but also be very thoughtful about that. I also like the idea of us exploring how we provide training opportunities. Uh, we have administrative associate positions, uh, opportunities that we can work in to do that so you can step into another area and gain some of that experience and exposure that allows you to be able to do that work. I'm also, uh, there's opportunities to volunteerism and I'm going to put this out here in a very thoughtful way. Um, in moments of contracted budgets, you want to hear me say this a lot, um, we're not going to be able to pay everybody for everything they want to do. We can't. But if this is about your professional development, exposure, and opportunity, I can probably guarantee you that if you say, hey, can I volunteer a couple hours of work and come into your area and learn how to do something over the next several weeks? Can I be a thought partner with you and network with you to figure out how to do some things? I suspect you will be opportunized very quickly to do that. That's Dr. That's, uh, George Payne always says that opportunize. So I really encourage that and I'm happy to talk with you a little bit more about that question if you like. Okay. Uh, another online question from another student uh, named Melanie. Uh, I saw some food being given away mm. last week. What is this all about and is this a one-time event? Oh, Melanie, you just made my day because this particular program um, is, is um, just soul food for me right now. Um, so our student affairs area in partnership with the Capital Area Food uh, Bank will be monthly distributing fresh fruits and vegetables and other food sources on each of our campuses once a month. Uh, 3,000 pounds, in fact, of food uh, were distributed at the Rockville campus, Germantown campus, and Tacoma Park is today or tomorrow? Two o'clock today. Um, and you come, you sign in, you get a bag, and you are able to get based on what they allocated, you know, five of this, six of these, 10 of those, or whatever. I'm so excited about this because this program um, speaks to the fact that one, um, we have hungry students. And we have had faculty and staff for many years that have staffed in um, uh, food pantries on each of the campuses. Um, but the reality about this is that that's not simply enough in all cases. Um, the other thing is that we have staff at the college who need help in their families and would welcome that. Uh, that's what, who I saw online. I went to the first one and I saw not only students, but community members who follow this program, who met <laughs> before we even opened up were there college employees who came. So I really want to say I'm really excited about this program because I know if you're hungry, you're not going to be able to learn. You're not going to feel focused. You're not going to have the ability to stay connected. And we don't want someone to be hungry uh, while they're here. I also think it's important it lifts up the fact that our students' lives are very complex and the students are trying to put together. When I was um, talking to a student that day, and I keep looking at uh, Dr. Brown because her office has led this work and they have done I think some tremendous lifting to bring this program here. Um, I was talking to a student there and she commented on she was so excited this was she got to have fresh vegetables. That was a huge thing for her to have fresh vegetables. And I said, isn't that something? I said, and I remember when I was in college, and I told her when I was in college I had food stamps. And I remember getting so excited when I found out I was poor enough to get food stamps. <laughs> and this is for real. This is straight up for real. Because I moved off campus. I found it was paying, and all of a sudden I was like, you qual I qualify for food stamps. And I got to go and pick fresh fruits and vegetables to bring into my home so that I could eat as a college student. This is for real. So we know that this is the experience of our students. I really want to thank Dr. Brown and her staff for bringing this and looking forward to seeing it grow uh, while we're here at Montgomery College. I want to thank Elite and uh, who brought in um, Sarah Goldrick Robb, who kind of she woke us up in a way that I think several of us were just waiting to be woke up on. So thank you for that. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, this is a, uh, another uh, online question from Tamara. Uh, does middle states accreditation really matter? Um, 
I keep hearing about it, but I haven't been to any of the meetings. Oh, Tamara. Girl, I'm going to need you to show up at a meeting. <laughs> I'm going to need you to understand that uh, Middle States accreditation is, um, how do I say that? It's a voluntary thing that the college has to do. However, it is high stakes volunteerism because if we don't do it, our students' credits aren't able to transfer, we don't qualify for federal financial aid, and we have a whole host of other issues that happen if we are not accredited as an institution. So uh, there are multiple regional accreditations. Uh, Montgomery College uh, is in the process of going through that process right now. We're completing our self-study. So what you can do tomorrow is to go online and read the self-study. Uh, that's, a, that's a very important thing. It's 100 pages, give or take. It is dense reading, but you want to make sure you read it. And then you want to be prepared because in March we have a visit from our accreditation team that will come here. They're going to walk around and talk to us and validate or dis unvalidate what it is we said about ourselves in the self-study based on the standards by which we were evaluated. Uh, find the website, please, and go and find out what's going on. All right. Um, this is actually someone, uh, Joe Trawick, uh, from the Staff Libraries, okay. uh, responded on the textbook issue oh. that the students brought up. Hey, Joe. And she said to always check the library. They may have some of the textbooks in-house. Oh, thank you. That's really good. Because uh, through a loan program or uh, you could check them out, use them for a couple hours and take them back in many cases. Great point. Thank you. All right. Uh, our next question is another student question from the class. It's it's a little bit lengthy, so bear with me. Okay. Um, the only complaint I would have was when scheduling classes, since this is my first year of college, I felt like there was a major disconnect between the college and the high school. My advisor told me three weeks before school started that I was able to take college level courses due to a PACE program. I had limited choices in classes and teacher and teachers. Why is there so much of a disconnect there? I am writing this to prevent uh, anyone else from experiencing this. Mm, thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I think you really speak to some of the challenges that exist in our educational system. Um, I, let me preface by saying Montgomery College and MCPS has a wonderful working relationship. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time and we have a lot of things in place that can hopefully um, make us, um, that have allowed it to be successful. That being said, uh, there are a lot of opportunities for improvement. And uh, in that we are both very large, NCPS is the 12th largest uh, community, uh, excuse me, high school, uh, a K-12 system in the country, 12th largest. Um, in Montgomery College, we are a, fair, a very large uh, community college and both of us enjoy a certain amount of bureaucracy. And I'll also say that we also get in our own way sometimes. Um, so one of the things that we are really doing intentionally now is putting together uh, teams of people that work from the college and from NCPS to sit down and navigate this. Uh, we have some phenomenal recruiters and um, our uh, onboarding system that we are completely revamping thanks to some work that's happening with some new staff that's happening there, but also very intentionally thinking about how do we get information sooner. Our communications team is working with them to do that, and also how do we start talking about this in ways that are accessible. You know, we don't have a county newspaper anymore, although most traditionally A students don't read the newspaper, even if they had one. Um, and we also know, but how do we communicate with you? Um, how do we make sure that you have the information you need? How do you start getting it earlier while you're in high school? So those are questions we have. I think you're right on. I don't have an answer to say that that is not correct. Uh, we just have to do a better job. And you just called us out yet again. Okay, uh, a couple of more comments from our students that uh, are with us today. Uh, this is actually a, just a comment. Okay. Uh, but it's a nice one, so. Um, yeah, what I like ones. about this school is all teachers are more than happy to help us students. That's a good one. That, I ain't got nothing to say. Says it all, that right? Says it all right there. All right. Uh, another student from the class uh, wants to know, is there any possibility of adding more and or different classes at, at Germantown and 
any chance of adding more flexible times to classes? Well, funny you should say that. Uh, the college is right now um, working on an initiative around the issue of schedule. Uh, what we have found out is oftentimes colleges uh, go through very archaic ways of scheduling classes. They tend to be very paper and pen based projects and we tend to do the same thing we did the last time. So whatever we did last fall, we'll say let's do it again this fall with very minor uh, changes. And we also oftentimes don't reflect the needs of students when we're doing those changes. So what's happening right now, we actually have the provost of this campus is leading an initiative with several members of the college community at looking at our schedule. Uh, looking at how we distribute classes, the times, uh, the ways in which the modes of delivery, online, hybrid, face-to-face, -face, uh, being very intentional about if a student has this um, degree and they've had this program of study, they're, and we ask students to think about laying it out over the, how do we then design schedules that are responsive to that and being very intentional to ensure that we also get maximum enrollment. So we are looking at issues of efficiency and effectiveness. So I'm hopeful you'll start to see some things that are really going to affect within the next, if not uh, this spring, there'll be some things happening, but also I think in the following year because we know we need to do a better job of that. I don't know which student, I've, and there's a whole other group of students over here, so it could be from y'all, but I'm like, either one. All right, uh, this is from, now, I have to remind people, we said, identify yourself, right? Oh, how'd they identify themselves? I think we have some people sort of skirting the line here. Okay. This is Professor J. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, why do we keep hearing so much about measuring things? Every time I open a message from MC, we're measuring some outcome or success rate. Can't we just teach? No. <laughs> I think that if, if following that logic, um, if a student just simply came to class, um, can we just simply say they learned because they showed up? I don't know of a faculty member that would accept that. I know when I taught, if I came to class every day and didn't submit a paper, uh, didn't do my project, um, and just simply said, I was here, I showed up, therefore I deserve X grade. Um, that model, unfortunately, has become uh, very problematic because now higher education is being called to do something very different. Uh, what they're saying is that we have invested millions and billions of dollars in higher education across this country. Uh, what we can simply see, though, is that we're not getting the returns that we need for that investment. And this is the broader public. This is taxpayers. These are elected officials that make important decisions about who we are and how we exist and the resources we have to do that work. And if we simply tell them, look here, we taught this and we're doing what we're supposed to do, but our completion and graduation rates stay the same. If we simply say that we taught this or we delivered this, but we have the same number of students who are transferring and the same number of successes and the same vacancies in the job market, but we're doing important work, that's not working anymore. What's very important about this, and this is the hard part that we, it, this is the new reality. I think for a lot of us, we keep thinking that, oh, this is just a fad. Accountability is, is going to change. Uh, this, is, this is just something that's here for right now. Um, it is every place we do because of metrics and technology and access to data. So now we're all going to be asked that because just as the county, here, here's an important point, going back to the top of the conversation here. Montgomery College receives 51 to 52 percent of our operating budget from the county. For the first time in the history of the college, as far as I know, they are now looking at accountability measures and how this organization is achieving the outcomes we say we're going to do, and they're going to hold us accountable and use that in consideration for future budget requests. So that letter I sent home to employees this summer, it wasn't intended to be ominous, <laughs> but it was intended to, to keep us woke, right? Because this is, a, this, is, this is the new reality. So we saw it at the federal level first, we see it at the state level, 
And now locally, will we get the majority of our resources from? This is the same question they're asking us. So, dear Ian, Dr. Pollard, when you sit in front of this panel, you're asking us for a 12% increase. What are we getting for this? How are you ensuring that these students are meeting the goals? How do you ensure that you're being efficient and effective with the resources we have? How are you delivering? Are you delivering a schedule that's responsive to the needs of students? Or are you delivering a schedule that's responsive to tradition and past and employees? These are the hard questions that they're asking me, and I'm sitting up here having to answer them. But at the end of the day, they're going to start making decisions. And we can say, I just taught. Can I just do that? That's not it. And I actually don't think that we really want to do that. I'm, I'm going to take that Professor T.P.J. was um, being somewhat, what's the word? Flip it, maybe? Yeah. Facetious. Because I, th I think, I know when I taught, I saw every semester as an opportunity to get better. Right? So I, I love the fact that our job at the end of 16 weeks, I got to start over again because I could have had a bad semester with a bad class that we just didn't connect with and had a really rough time. And guess what? I got to start all over again in 16 weeks. And I got to say, hmm, that assignment didn't work last time. How do I know it didn't work? Because I saw a student's performance on this particular assignment. Therefore, I tweaked it, improved it. I had my evidence to support that. So I got to believe, particularly if you're a faculty member at Montgomery College, you already know this. So thank you, Professor, for keeping us woke. All right, uh, we have another student question from our students here today. Right. And the, the question is sort of brief, so I do want to uh, point out that I have heard similar things from other students okay. um, and also some faculty and staff who've taken classes online. This is about the online um, experience, I okay. guess you could say. Uh, According to this student, Blackboard feels very cluttered and disorganized, and she has trouble finding, navigating her way through it. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there any opportunity or any, any plans to, to update that? That's a really great question. I don't know. Uh, I will admit, I don't have to use Blackboard very often. Uh, we do use it for some meetings, groups I'm in. We keep materials there. So I do think your point is well taken because um, uh, is it fresh? Is it easily to be navigated? Does it uh, help you find what you're looking for? So he stood up because he knew I was going to call on him. Uh, Dr. Mills, might you talk to me a little bit about what's happening with Blackboard Mike? Dr. Mills needs, needs the mic. So he's going to tell us what we know about Blackboard and what we don't know. Sure. Uh, we offer a number of different professional development opportunities for faculty to uh, design their classes within Blackboard. As with any learning experience, some faculty take advantage of those, some do not. Um, all classes are different. We don't have a boilerplate that all faculty have to use. Uh, we provide a template that they can modify as they deem appropriate. But we do offer a, a lot of professional development chances for faculty. And I would encourage the students, if they're having problems navigating Blackboard, to talk to their faculty member about that. Um, and you know, we can, my team can certainly work with the faculty to get that resolved. Thank you. So I, I think what I heard him say is, talk to your faculty member. Let them know that this is, is challenging. Here's why. And then there are resources that we can help provide them to do that. Great question. All right, um, NL from staff, here okay. we go again. Uh, what is your favorite student success initiative and how can we make it sustainable and make it a long-term part of the co co college culture, creating a student-first mindset throughout the college? Hmm. Yeah, there, there are so many, there's so much Wonderful. My son, up until last year, kept getting much and many mixed up. I don't know. I, I mean, I've been trying to figure out why the singular plural thing. So I had to catch myself right there. There's so much or many, uh, so many things that are happening uh, within the organizations in terms of student success. Um, but I, I, so I'm not going to pick, I'm going to pick one because it's fresh in my mind from this morning. Um, and there's, so before anybody says this is her favorite, it's not my favorite. <laughs> 
but I'm getting old and there's a lot of stuff in my head. And this is the first, I'm remembering this because I just heard a phenomenal presentation about our Achieving the Promise Academy, which is doing phenomenal work, uh, pairing coaches to work with students one on one, and also pairing, uh, embedding part time faculty who have taught within that discipline in classes with faculty to serve as support systems to students. Now, I don't know about you all, but I, students, maybe y'all can let me know afterwards. I won't put you on blast right now. But if I were, have the opportunity to have someone who's going to coach me along, if I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm trying to figure out how to navigate this thing called higher education at Montgomery College and a very complex, large organization, and here's somebody who's done it, been successful and is invested enough in me to want me to do that, I'm gonna probably take my take up on that and, and feel that somebody's paying attention to me in a place that's very large like this, or also have somebody who's embedded in my classroom who teaches the class, who's there to serve as a support, but also is not teaching in that moment. They're a resource to the faculty member and the student. I think that's pretty cool. Um, and the fact that they have about 18, over 1,800 students and uh, they're being affected right now in this program in multiple sections and very targeted. I think that's pretty, I think that's pretty phenomenal. So that's my favorite thing that I learned today. But if you had talked to me last week, I'd have told you about the food because I remember being hungry in college. Uh, I remember that. I know how hard that is. But I can go around the room and almost every person in here is associated with something. I said, oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I think we are, I actually thought about this, Ray, when we were sitting in uh, I know one more thing I keep asking you to do, but there's this, um, <laughs> I kept thinking, we, how do we capture our story about this work that, that's happening here? I mean, that to me is really powerful. Maybe folks are seeing it, maybe Carnegie sees it because that's what Montgomery College is doing, but you know, these, in our innovation works, is how do we actually put out on a quarterly basis something that talks about transformational success that's happening in student learning at Montgomery College. And that's an inspiration to those people who are within the organization, but also those who are outside the organization. I've been thinking a lot about that, because I was sitting here listening to that when I was listening to the ATP program earlier, I was like, yeah, Ali, I can't wait to see in six months the data that she had, because you know I'm all over that. So I just think that's gonna be a really exciting thing to watch. So we need to talk about that, put us on our to-do list. One more thing. One more thing. See how he said that? One more thing. <laughs> All right, we have a question from the audience. Yes. Oh, uh, guy who didn't want to sit on the front row. Hi, my name's uh, Leo. Hello, Leo. And uh, my question was, why don't we have more sports? Hmm. Like contact sports, like football and lacrosse. So um, we do not. Ha uh, we used to have football at the college, and we no longer have football for two very important reasons. One is that we don't have adequate competition in the area to allow us to deliver that sport in a very competitive way. The other is that it's very expensive. Uh, football is probably one of the most expensive uh, collegiate sports that exists. Um, and you know, uh, do you play football? And you probably know all this stuff. Mostly lacrosse. Lacrosse, okay, so you know a lot of things are going that. Uh, Two-year institutions, we have a certain, we have to balance uh, issues around equity, we have to balance finances. We also have to figure out how to allow, uh, for us, an equitable distribution of sports on multiple campuses. We do have a new athletic director who's sitting somewhere near you. There she is, uh, Coach uh, Tarloff, who's there. And if there is a particular sport that you think that we should be delivering, we deliver 13, how many sports? Huh? Nine uh, sports here at the college. Um, and we certainly could explore others if there are ample interest and in a coach. Is that a fair way of saying it? Opportunities for us to look at. And she's sitting right there in front of you, so if you have some ideas, let her know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, online question from a student named Christopher. All right, Christopher. Um, I have heard you talk about equity more this year. Mm. How is equity different from diversity and inclusion? Mm. So, Christopher, Chris, um, you hear me talk more about it because I think it's the defining issue of our generation right now. Uh, I think that as a complex organization that lives where we live, we have done a very good job for a number of years of bringing diversity to our student population. Matter of fact, any piece of literature about the college, 
Nine times out of 10, we're gonna have in there, we have no majority race at Montgomery College and we have students from 160, 70, depends on which year it is, countries that exist here. And well, beautiful, isn't it? So we'll, we'll talk about that. What we haven't talked about is the experience of those folks who are here. Um, we haven't talked about equitable outcomes in terms of student learning. So the literature is very compelling and, and our data is this. Black and brown students do not, have not performed at the same level as white and Asian students in terms of outcomes. Why is that? We can't just simply take it as a fact that this is happening. How and why is this occurring? I think there are systemic issues that become very important in that conversation. So diversity just counts who's in the room, right? It says, we got one of you, we got one, it's like Noah's Ark, two of them, two of them, two of them, two of them, and we're diverse, right? But we don't talk about access to the power structure of the organization when we do that. We don't talk about the ways in which they feel when they go to different places on campus. We don't talk about the challenges that come in that. And, I, and I'm really, uh, we have, I'm looking at some faculty members in sociology, history, political science who could break this down on a whole different level than I am. But what I think is really compelling about that is equity for me is about ensuring that we aren't just simply counting the people in the room but we're ensuring that they have access to the same resources, that they have this, a similar experience, that where they feel valued, they can contribute, that they learn, and at the end of the day, that there are no barriers to their success here based on the fact that an organization, we're thinking deeply about how they experience the college. Um, you'll hear me talk more about that, and we're gonna talk a whole lot about it as a college because it should make us a little uncomfortable it should make us want to stretch and think differently. You know, Dr. Rye, he, I'm still stuck on this one. A couple weeks ago, we were talking about the same issue. He said the first equity decision that the college makes is on placement. Those of us who work at the college, you think about that, how we place a student, because the literature and our data tells us very, if a student gets placed in certain levels of English or math when they step into this organization, we can almost predict their success level. So we know that, do we just accept it as something that we know, or do we do something about it? Equity means you do something about it. Diversity means you just counted it. And then if you really want to take it someplace else, social justice means you remove the barriers. Just didn't knock them out the way. All right, I'm sorry, I get on the roll. All right, uh, this might be our last question, it depends. Um, this is from Brittany, a student at Rockville. Uh, last year I took a certified nursing assistance course through WDNCE and was placed in a job in a doctor's office. Hmm. Now I'm back at MC and taking English and other classes towards my, my AA. Can the CNA experience be considered for credit for prior learning? That's equity. <laughs> right? That, that's the conversation. That's about asking us to think differently about how we have traditionally done so for, I don't know, that's, that student's pretty, <laughs> that she's not already thought about this from an issue of saying, okay, how do I take this experience that I have? Now I'm gonna tell you, as an organization, we probably not ready for that question. We getting there, we getting there. But that to me, so uh, anybody, can anybody answer that question? Anybody answer that question? That means we, we don't know, Brittany, but I'm gonna find out. Oh, you wanna say something, Dr. Rye? Oh, my, oh, go ahead, George, you, you, you can be opportunized. <laughs> I think uh, George should be answering the question, but um, I think uh, she should be able to get the credit. Uh, credit for prior learning is an evolving uh, concept, and Montgomery College is ahead. In my hand, I have our academic master plan, and one of the initiative is to bring credit for prior learning to students. And uh, maybe, uh, without putting pressure on anyone, within one year, uh, we should see some movements. Thank you. Yeah, don't y'all wonder, he just carried this thing around with him all the time. <laughs> I'm just carrying an academic master plan with me. But I do know it's an important issue that we're working on right now. So, Brittany, I hope that in a couple months you'll be able to hear a different answer from me, or rather hear an answer from me. Thank you. All right, well, that is all the time that we have today. That went fast. Uh, I do want to thank Dr. Pollard and to each and every one of you for participating 
in today's town hall. Now, I would encourage you to keep an eye on the President's Corner Monday message and also Inside MC Online for all the details on our next town hall. It's scheduled for November at the Tacoma Park Silver Spring Campus. And if you want to keep on top of everything that's going on at MC, we'd love you to follow Montgomery College and Montgomery College Television on social media.